Matthew, the first chapter, verse 18, there's a familiar passage that you know from your early hearing. And it reads like this, Matthew 1, verse 18 reads like this. Now the birth of Jesus was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife. Don't be afraid to marry her. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. And all of this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. Amen. I want to speak from this subject the Father God chooses. The Father God chooses. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh God, my strength and my redeemer, it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Now, somebody needs to turn the light on because I think I, I, I don't think you can see me. Uh, I got all this black on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now today is Father's Day. And I want to speak about a man, a father, who is who is often very overlooked. I think in some quarters he is overshadowed by the by the prominence given his wife. In other words, Mary gets more praise than Joseph. I know I'm right. Yeah, yeah. Joseph was the husband of Mary and the adopted father of Jesus. And just like Joseph is overlooked, so are many men in today's family. We can't even have our own day. <laughs> Men are often thought of as not necessary. But I want you to know today that men are necessary. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I told you, I, I, the girls that I dated, I could tell whether they had a father in the house. You know how I could tell? Whether or not they wanted me to open the door for them. See, the women that didn't have a dad in the house, they didn't, they didn't know that a man's supposed to be chivalrous, especially when he's trying to court you, and supposed to do stuff for you, like open the door for you. I can't get no amens right now to do that. <laughs> Where am I living now? Am I living in a, a bizarre world? I'm just talking about when I grew up. If, if, if the girl didn't have a dad in the house, she didn't know how to be treated. That's the point I'm trying to make. 
But those that have a father in the house, nine times out of ten, watch how their dad treated their moms and expected the same thing out of the men that they dated. Now, I know my wife sometimes, she will stand at the door and won't even tell me to open it up. Just stand there. <laughs> and wait for me to make a move. And I have to be reminded of who I am. Now, now, you know, the little girl also wants me to open the door for her. Now, I have to tell her that when she get a husband, then you have him open the door for you. <laughs> but I'm opening the door for my wife. But, you know, anyway, she opened the, I open the door for her too sometimes. But anyway, the point of it is, is that there's an expectation when you have a father in the house of some things that young women who don't have a dad in the house don't expect because they don't know. Are you with me? And it's hard to hear stories about Mary, but we seldom hear stories about Joseph. And I believe it's a, it's a significant thing that even as God chose Mary to be the one who would give birth to the Son of God, it is also in God's providence that God chose a particular man to be the protector and provider of his son. Are y'all with me today? He chose Joseph to be the father and to raise Jesus into manhood. And Mary and Joseph were chosen together to be parents. God went looking for parents to raise his beloved, only begotten son. And the most precious thing God has is his children. And we know that the most precious thing that we have are our children. Amen, church. You know, just like I know, that if, if, it, if it's a choice between your child being taken and you being taken, you will always choose yourself to give your child a chance in this world. And, and, and God does not put anybody in charge of his children. He searched the earth and he found a young girl. And the Bible says she found favor with God. She was a choice young lady, a God-fearing young lady. But no, God also went looking for a father. He called Mary and Joseph as a couple. And here is the point of it. God clearly demonstrates for us that the role of the father is as, as important as the role of the mother. Fathers are not only needed for the physical act of conceiving a child, they are also needed for the spiritual act of raising a child. See, you can't just be the, a father who just, who just make a donation. If you're a real daddy, you're going to stay around and help raise the child up. You're going to go through the hormones that the children go through. You're going to be there with them when they make mistakes. You're going to give them your wisdom, your, 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 your knowledge, your experience. You're going to share all of you with your child so that your child will grow up with the best opportunity to be a respectful citizen in this world. Mm -hmm. The child was conceived in the womb of Mary by the Holy Ghost. A miracle took place there, so no need for a man to be involved in the conception of Jesus. But a man was still needed to fill the role of father in Jesus' childhood. So, so even if you got a child in your house, and you weren't responsible for conceiving the child, God still put you in place to help raise the child. Amen. I know I'm right about it. Because listen, 
We live in a society today where there is mixed, what I call mixed and blended families. Everybody got a child, or most people got a child out of wedlock from, or from a previous relationship, and then they come into a new relationship, and everybody got these children from various places, various experiences and situations. I can't get no amen, but I'm just telling the truth. We don't have the nuclear family no more. Nobody has, you know, got married early, 18, 19, raised their children up, stayed married for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and had the same nuclear family. Y'all, are y'all with me? Yeah. We live in a society now where people have children out of wedlock or, or not being married, or they are they in marriage, they get a divorce, they have children, whatever. Or people die and they still have children. In my, in my case, my mother had four children. My stepfather had seven children. And for some reason, they thought that was a good idea to get married. <laughs> and then have two more children. Are y'all with me? So we went from a nuclear family to a, 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 a mixed family to a blended family. Are y'all with me today? And a lot of us got situations like that. We may have uh, a daddy who's got two children from some other woman. Are y'all with me? But those still your siblings. Your mama may have, you may know all your mama's children, but you may not know all your daddy's children. I wish I had a praying church up here. I'm just trying to talk the truth in here today. Y'all not helping me. Y'all gonna make me preach longer than I have to because y'all not saying amen. If you just say amen, when you hear the truth, I can go on with my lesson. But I'm getting stuck right here because I can't get no amen, man. <laughs> y'all know I'm right, so you best well help me out. Help a brother so he can move on. So so having said that, let, let, let me say a word to a single parent here today. Please don't despair that your children are beyond hope because their father is gone or their mother is gone. That's not the case. God is still gracious. Look what the text says. Through my father and mothers forsake me, yet the Lord will take me up. Listen, God is still love you no matter what. You were put here on purpose. And whoever the Lord put in your life, God got them there on purpose. Sometimes, you know, you there to help change the situation. Let me tell you something. Every child that comes into the world changes everything. <laughs> they change the environment that they in. And then sometimes the situation is there to help change you. To help mold you and make you who you are. But I do want you to know that God put you here on purpose. And those single parents I know will testify to the multiple the difficulties when one parent is gone. Single parents today, we salute you. And we honor you. We honor those single mothers. God bless you for your diligence for those children. And so we know that mothers have done a marvelous job of raising children uh, uh, sometimes by themselves. Yeah. But I do want you to know this, that in every situation, especially in our community, the, the black community, we do have extended families. We do have people who sort of step in. We have an uncle, we have a cousin, we have a grandfather uh, who steps in uh, when, when, when the main parent can't do it. Are y'all with me? Yeah. And, and that's the tradition. That's our tradition. You know, some people say, well, I was raised by my grandmother. Yeah, a whole lot of us been raised by our grandmothers. And then, when, and then for those of us who have uh, decided that they were going to raise their children and that they, they happy, they done, they free, and then the grandbabies start coming. <laughs> And 
And then sometimes the children come back. Amen. And you ain't free no more. You, you, got, to, you got to help raise the baby. Uh, Y'all with me? But by that time, you got a little bit more sense. You understand how to raise people. By the time you become a grandparent, you understand. When you are, when you are, when you are, when you are parent, you sort of practicing on your children. You, you, you don't know exactly what you're supposed to do, and you sort of, you sort of practice a little bit. And when that don't work, you try to regroup yourself. The good thing about it that children are resilient; that they can handle a few mistakes. <laughs> And the, and the other thing about it, children love you no matter what. They, they, they love their parents no matter what. I don't care what you do. And that's why if you're in a blended family, you should never talk about the other child's parent. Are you with me today? If your wife gets to talking about her ex, which is the child's daddy, don't you open your mouth. Let me give you what your response should be. Mmm. My. Well. You don't say. That's your response. Because as soon as you start talking about, yeah, and you get into the battle with it, she's going to turn around to you and say, and what about you? And then now the fight is with you and her. Instead of hurting somebody else. Yes. Are y'all with me today? Yes. So, so don't do it. So Joseph was chosen. And just as God had looked for a godly woman to bring forth a child, God looked for a godly man to be the father. And what an inspiring model of fatherhood we see in Joseph. God made a good choice. Joseph was not the only child... Jesus was not the only child Joseph had. There were other boys that he also raised up in girls. Two of them, at least, were greatly used by the Lord. They wrote books of the Bible, James and Jude. Jesus was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. James, excuse me, was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Joseph, and to be honest with you, James was the leader of the church. Not Peter. Some people think that Peter was the leader. But the reality of the matter is James was the leader of the church after Jesus died. It was James who was put in charge. Joseph raised his children in the ways of the Lord and he left behind a legacy after his lifetime. Let's look together for a few minutes at some things the Bible tells us about the man that God chose to raise his son, Joseph. First of all, note with me that God chose a father, first of all, that was devoted, a devoted man. Look what Matthew 18 says. Now the birth of Jesus was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found a child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and wanting to not to make her a public example, was minded to put her away. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Now the scriptures draw a picture for us for a wonderfully caring and affectionate man. Now I want you to understand this, that he was, he was devoted to Mary, devoted to his wife. Now she wasn't his wife at first. She was his engaged wife. Now, a lot of people say that, no, people don't know now, Jesus didn't have a single mother. Yes, he did. At conception, Jesus' mama was not married. Now, there's a whole lot of us, we get so religious because people have children out of wedlock, and we think that, be, that, that makes us more holier than that. And when we point to Jesus, our Lord and Savior, his mom, had a baby, got pregnant, and she went back. 
then y'all must want me to preach longer. Y'all really itching for me just to, just to stay up here all day. Y'all itching for me. Maybe they want me to preach a long time today. I don't want to preach long today. I want to preach a short sermon and go home. It's Father's Day. He was devoted to Mary, his wife. Amen. The text says that when he found out that she was pregnant yeah. by somebody other than him, Amen. and he knew it wasn't him Amen. because they hadn't got together yet, Amen. what the text says. Amen. He says, here's what I'm going to do. I, you know, I love you, but I got my own pride. Mm -hmm. And because I got my own pride, I can't marry no situation like this. I can't find myself in no situation like this. I can't do it. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to privately get together and just break up the situation, break up the marriage, the, the, the marriage, and don't nobody have to know anything about it. That's what he said. Listen, one of the things you got to understand is, is that if you are in a relationship with your, with, a, with, a, with, with your wife or husband, that you can't do stuff to embarrass them. Don't embarrass your fiance or your husband. That's not good. I told y'all about the story about me and my wife at the first church that we, that we pastored. And um, um, we were trying to raise money for the building that we had. And, um, and I got excited. And um, I, told, I told my wife, I said, baby, I want to tell the people that I want to give a thousand dollars to to help start the fundraiser off to to to, start, to raise this money for the church. My wife said, No, you're not. <laughs> we ain't giving no. We didn't get the thousand dollars from. <laughs> we ain't giving no thousand dollars. Now, some couples have separate accounts. He got hers, she got hers, and y'all got y'all's together. Me and my wife, it's not like that. My wife got hers, and then we got ours. <laughs> there ain't no, ain't no separate account. But one thing I could not do was go to the church and say, well, I'm going to give 500 and embarrass my wife. Are y'all with me? Amen. So I had to suffer. My wife knew I wanted to make the announcement to help start raising the money, and I couldn't do it. And then my wife had a friend who was a Muslim, and they had Ramadan. And during Ramadan, you fast during the day. You fast during the entire daytime. Um, and then at night you can, you, know, you can eat again. So my wife said she was going to go on this fast with this Muslim lady at her job. And, and during the fast, sometime during the fast, the Lord told my wife to listen to her husband. I said, how you know God is good? <laughs> now, now, now listen now, it took us an hour and a half to get to church every morning. One way. So on the way to church, my wife revealed to me that the Lord had told her to listen to her husband. And her husband said, we gonna give a thousand dollars. She said, baby, I'm ready to do it. Boy, I couldn't get out that car fast enough. I got to that pulpit and I told the church, we ain't giving a thousand dollars. And nobody knew that my wife and I had struggled about giving the money in the first place. You understand what I'm saying? I'm told the world now, but it's good. It's a good. It's a good story. 
It's a good ending to it. But the point of it is, I was not going to embarrass my wife in front of the church. And we got to learn that you can't come to church and tell people about your private business to people about your husband. And you can't do that. You can't do that. That's between you and him. But you got, but he was devoted to Mary. And not only that, he was devoted to his children. He was devoted to Jesus. When the child came along, Jesus had not con had not been conceived. There was there was an attitude Joseph had. The little boy isn't my flesh and blood. And so he sort of had a little bit of resentment. He wasn't going to be involved. But Joseph adopted Jesus as his son. He protected him from the hatred of Herod. He nurtured him and cared for him. And evidently he taught Jesus his own trade, which is carpentry. He adopted the one that the rest of the world would reject. He understood what it means to be in the family. And today, by contrast, we see men who are prepared to, to abdicate their role, even toward their own children sometimes. Listen to me, uh, men. You cannot, if you, even if you divorce your wife, you cannot divorce your children. You can't do that. You still have to love your children. And you have to love them. You have to be devoted to them. That, that means that you got to take some time out to play with them, to talk to them. And I said before and I said again that our biggest problem is that we got so many things in front of our children that we can't see our children. Now, for young guys, I know that y'all play that Xbox and Madden and all that, and now they got the, all that stuff on your phones and stuff now. So your children can't, can't even get a headway to you because your head is down in that game. You better lift your head up. And when your children speak to you, you better take your phone. Let me see, I got my phone. You better take your phone and turn it down. And listen to your child. Amen. Amen. Listen to me. When your children want to talk to you, they listen, they, they, they get to an age where they don't want to they don't even want to look at you. They go to their room, they hide in there, and you don't even see them until it's time to eat again. And then they take that food and run that food into the room. You understand what I'm saying? So when your children want to talk to you, you better listen. We got to stop. Letting other stuff get in the way. And listen to me. I don't care how much you, you may say, well, you know, uh, I, I show my love by, by bringing my paycheck home. That's good. You ought to do that. You don't get no credit for that. You don't get no credit for that. That's what you're supposed to do. Now, what you need to do in addition to that is to make sure that you sit down and talk to your children. I'm not talking about having no meeting with them. We're going to meet Friday at 5 o'clock. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Anytime your child want to talk to you, and this is what I tell my wife, that our phone is always on for Oriana. I don't care what meeting I'm in, where I am, if the phone rings and Oriana's name comes across there, I'm stopping and I'm answering the phone. I don't care what I'm doing. Even if I have to say, I have to listen, baby, what's going on? Uh, can I get the game? Okay, look, I'm going to talk to you when I get home. <laughs> you know, we got the phone where she, she can't get games without our permission. Amen. You understand? Amen. So she'll call and ask, can she get a game? Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is, the point I'm trying to make is, no matter what the issue is, we got to stop and listen to our children. So she was devoted to her husband, devoted to his wife. In other words, he didn't embarrass her. He tried to make sure he took care of her. And then he was devoted to his, to his family. Not only that, he was a devout man. The text says that he showed devoutness, first of all, by listening. He explicitly followed the Lord's leading and direction. He didn't follow his own 
marked out plan for life. He wanted God's plan for his life. His plan was to divorce her privately. At first, he didn't consult God. And he didn't seek out God's plan. He knew what to do. Let her go. That's the right thing for him to do. That when she messed up, and from any human perspective, if I had been with my wife, and my wife tell me she's pregnant, it's time to let her go. Because I didn't do it. <laughs> But if my wife get pregnant now, then I know I know it's God. I know the whole, I know God will be something. But the point I'm trying to make is, she got to go. He he did what was what was what was logically and physically correct for him to do, and he did it. He wanted to do it privately. But when God got with him, when God spoke to him and pricked his heart and touched his mind and changed his situation. He had to come up with God's plan. And God's plan for him was to marry his wife. And he listened to God. And all I'm saying, brothers, is this. That sometimes we got to put our plans aside and let God do his thing. Let God do his thing. Let God do his thing. When God spoke and said, take Mary and Jesus and flee to Egypt for safety, he immediately obeyed. He closed up his business and he left. And then when God said, it's okay now to come back to Israel, again he did and he was, as he was directed. He was a man of obedience. And for another thing, he showed his devoutness not only by listening, but he showed his devoutness by being a man of faith. It takes faith to pack up your bags and head off into a foreign country with no prospects and no plan, simply on the basis that God said so. He had faith and he obeyed the dream. He could have made excuses to stay where the prospects looked good, but no, he was a man of faith. Fathers here this morning, your faith will speak louder than your faults. Listen to me. Your children will see your faith more than they will see your faults. If you trust in God, your children will see it. Raise them in an environment of faith toward God. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not only that, he showed devoutness by being faithful in spiritual duty. He set an example for his family. Going to the temple, attending the feast. And we read about it in Luke 2, 41. Well, he says his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. He was a regular in going to God's house. Listen, I don't care how much money you make, how much education you have, I don't care where you're from, you need to show your children that you love the Lord. And, and unfortunately, listen to me, you are not going to be able to show your children how you trust in God by watching the while watching the TV on Sunday morning. Now listen to me. My dad loved us. I love my dad to the day. You know, like I said, my dad died when I was six years old. But those six years, I still love my dad. Every time I think about him, I almost come to tears because I love him so much. But my dad didn't go to church. He took us to church. And dropped us off. I still remember that. But then my dad did get saved. Toward the end of his life. And he did go to church. And became a deacon. It was a short lived time. But the point of it is. I remember that about my dad. 
at six years old, I remember his devotedness to God. And, and don't think that I've been in church all my life, although I have. <laughs> I've been in church, but church ain't been in me. You, you, can, you can be in the house, but the house don't have to be in you. I, I, I was at church. But a lot of my focus wasn't on the Lord. It was on something else. When I was in church. All right. Well, thank you, sis. Now I got not now I can shut down because I got one person saying they go there. I'm ready to close. I'm ready to close. But don't, but let me just say this. He he was he was he was he was devoted. He was devout. But my dad, I remember, you see, your children are gonna remember the faithfulness that you have. And believe me, at a young age, they're gonna still remember. And like I said, my dad died when I was six years old. But look what I remember about him. I remember that. And then finally, he was a, he was a discerning man. In other words, he was wise. Fathers, none of us know how much time we got left with our children, with our families. And you may only have a year, two years, five years, who knows? Only God knows. Now listen to me here carefully. Joseph was wise because he lived as one redeemed who redeemed the time. By all accounts, it seems that Joseph had a shortened life. We don't read about him after Jesus' childhood, at the cross. Jesus charged uh, John to take care of his mother. So it seems Joseph was taken from them prematurely. We don't know what happened to Joseph. But Joseph had used what time he had been given honorably. That is, he used it wisely. He had provoked, he had provided for his children, for his family. He set an example for them that they had that they will remember. And he raised them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now we are redeeming the time as Joseph did. We, we need to encourage our families at every opportunity, setting an example, providing for their needs. I, I, I mentioned in verse earlier, in, in 1 Timothy 5, the text says this, but if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially those of his household, he is denied, the, he has denied the faith and is worse than the unbeliever. Text of King James Version used the word infidel. If you don't provide for your family, the Bible says that a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. You need to be working on how to give something to your grandchildren. And if you want to be remembered, if you want your children and your grandchildren to remember you, you need to give them something. They ain't gonna remember those who ain't gave them nothing. You ain't give them nothing. You ain't leave them nothing. You didn't remind them of anything. They're not gonna know who you are. And guess what? Most of them ain't gonna care who you are. They're gonna be glad you're gone. Or they, they, they don't even know that you've been, been around. And that's sad. And it shouldn't be. That, when, that when, when our children see us, they ought to be happy to see us. They ought to be glad to see us. They ought to be excited about us. I know, I know my wife, and I hear, I hear Sister, Sister Cobb and Sister uh, Harrison, 86, 83, they're, they're in the 80s. They're going to tell everything. But they still talk about their daddy like he was here yesterday. Because they love their daddy. My wife, when she speak about her dad, she loved her dad. Her dad was a deacon in the church for many years. President of the NAACP down there in Western, but he, on the barbershop, all that. But she remember her dad because he left something in her heart. And all I'm saying today, brethren, is that if we're gonna be the men that God has called to raise, that God chooses, be a man 
who is devoted, who is devout, and who is deserving. Give God some praise. He's worthy to be praised. Amen. Amen. Will you stand with us today? There might be somebody here in the house, and there might be somebody that's listening to us on, on, the, on the YouTube. If you're here today, we invite you. And let me just say this to you. You can say this prayer with me. Will you bow your heads? Heavenly Father, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. And make me as one of your children. I admit that I'm a sinner and I need you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you said that little short prayer, you say it. And so we invite you to come be a part of our experience. And we're here at 5050 Beach Place in Temple Hills, Maryland at 9 a.m. You can meet with us anytime here. But there might be somebody here in the house today who don't know the Lord. If you're here, we invite you to come. There might be others here who need a church home. If you're here, we invite you to come. And then there might be others in the house who need prayer. Well, I'm going to ask our fathers to come today. Come on, Tasha. I know that you need prayer, so you come on, stand around the altar. Ask all our fathers to come. Let's give these men a round of applause. These are our men. Now, I will, I will get opportunity for those children who want to come stand with their fathers. If you want to come stand with your father. Come on, Miss Oriana.
who does all things well. We give you all the praise today, Lord. For you are the only living and true God. And before you, there is no other. We give you the praise, God, because you woke us up this morning. Oh, Be with them in a mighty way. 